What's up, everybody? Been a while since we hopped on one of these spaces, but you know, season kicking off on Saturday. Teased it earlier this week that we'd probably be hopping on some Twitter spaces this week for an episode like we did, you know, kicking it off. Heck, I think it was one of the first ones last year to uh, <laughs> use these Twitter spaces as an, as an episode for a podcast. It's kind of uh, our call-in style of show, but everybody, thanks for uh, hopping on here. Of course, the depth chart versus Utah gets released and some interesting, interesting observations we have all made so far. Nothing, nothing cr- crazy, crazy, at least for me, maybe some of you out there, but not, nothing too far out there. That is probably the best way to put it. We'll go through, see where it is. Man, it's been a while since I've, I've done one of these, so it's this little... Um, button there, so I guess, I guess people can reply inside of the space now with text as well. Okay, that's pretty cool. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while since I've even joined one. Uh, maybe even uh, since we've done one with the Gator Collective back in the uh, back in the summertime. But yeah, anybody who wants to jump in, give me your thoughts as well. I'll go through it right quick before I bring you guys in here. I am recording this for an episode, so if you are listening post, post live, post recording. Thank you so much for checking it out. But here we go. I'll go in order of the graphic that was released by Florida. So we'll start at wide receiver, one of the wide receiver positions. Xavier Henderson, Dejon Reynolds, Marcus Burke. There is your, one of your outside spots. Justin Shorter, Jaquavion Frazier's is the other. Then we move to the slot, Ricky Pearsall or Trent Riddlemore and Jamarcus Weston. So there you go. There's your receivers. Not a big surprise at all there from basically everything we heard through the spring. And then fall as well. You know, Xavier Henderson has been a name we've heard consistently with Ricky Pearsall missing some time. Justin Shorter missing some time. Henderson seemed like he was one of the top receivers who was able to go through all of fall camp, Trent Whittemore as well. And good thing for you know Trent because <laughs> he's been banged up throughout his career so far at Florida, being able now to go through a fall camp there. But uh, Ricky Pearsall or Trent Whittemore there in the slot, which I kind of expected. Uh, and Pearsall can play outside as well. Uh, so no surprises there uh, at receiver the names we expected to hear, some form or fashion, are there at wide receiver. Uh, offensive line, definitely no surprises there. I will start with the starters. Left tackle, Richard Garage. Left guard, Ethan White. Center, Kingsley Egwakon. Right guard, Osiris Torrance. Right tackle, Michael Tarquin. And then, two deep, here we go. Left tackle, Cameron Waits to transfer from Louisiana. Right guard, Richard Leonard. Center, Jake Slaughter, right guard, Josh Braun, no surprise there. Right tackle, Austin Austin Barber, no surprise there from what we heard at the beginning of fall camp. Uh, With with Barber coming in, Garage, of course, started fall camp a little banged up. It might have been the blessing in disguise. Uh, Of course, he has played so much football in his career of course, the new system coming in, you'd like to see him out there, but as we said, kind of maybe maybe a blessing in disguise because Florida needed to build some depth up there at the uh, up there at the offensive line position. Maybe if you know now, find yourself eight deep there with the Florida. We've been through that on some of the uh, most recent episodes of Gators Breakdown there. So, all right, now we move to tight end. Dante Zanders has his name called there. On that first line for tight end, and then Keon Zipperer there. We know there's a ton of names <laughs> you can throw at, at that tight end position, but it is Dante Zanders listed, Keon Zipperer listed as well. We, we'll see more than that. Uh, we, 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 I, I think we all know uh, we'll see more than that. It does. Um, I will move toward the injury report there for the outs 
the four players listed out are this boarding him as one of those. Uh, so I know that was a, you know, a freshman we, we were hearing about early on in fall camp, but he is listed out uh, in this game. And I guess I'll, I'll just keep going there. Jaden Hill out, Jack Miller out, David Connor out uh, as well for the Gators. So there's your four uh, guys listed out there for the Gators. But you, you start looking, no surprise, once again, at tight end. So many guys there. I mean, we, we, we know you're probably going to hear from Jonathan Odom, Nick Elksness. Uh, there at the same time. At, at least those two guys, I, I, I expect them to be on the field a bit Saturday night versus Utah. Next position on the depth chart, quarterback Anthony Richardson, no surprise there. Jalen Kitna listed second, Kyle Engel, or is Kitna or Engel uh, right there behind Anthony Richardson. And then maybe the first surprise. And only because <laughs> only three running backs are listed. Lorenzo Lingard is not one of them. Naquan Wright is listed as the starter. Then Montreal Johnson or true freshman Trevor Etienne. So, I mean, I, I expect Lingard to play uh, Saturday. I expect to see him on the field. Could they have listed four? On offense, it doesn't go past three names on the depth chart. Uh, as I mentioned, at one of the receiver positions, it goes Henderson. Dejon Reynolds, Marcus Burt, only three, only three listed. The, one of the other receivers, Pearsall, Whittemore, Weston, only three listed. Um, three quarterbacks listed, three running backs listed. Now, I, you probably could have thrown Lingard on there, but only three are listed, and it is a true freshman, Trevor Etienne, getting listed third behind Naquan Wright and Montreal Johnson, but it is a Montreal Johnson or Trevor Etienne um, don't really know that these ors could mean or for the whole group. No, I, that could be something here. Um, Billy Napier's doing. I'm, I'm sure he's the one who filled out the offensive side. Patrick Tony fills out the defensive side because on the defensive side, you do have some of the positions go four deep when listing the depth chart. So let's start there or let's go there. Let's go to the defensive side. Defensive end. Princely, you men yelling, gets a start at defensive end. Justice Boone behind him at one of the defensive end spots. Nose tackle, here we go. Jalen Lee, Desmond Watson, Jalen Humphreys, Jamari Lyons. Desmond Watson, by the way, listed 439. 6'5", 439 pound Desmond Watson. Uh, listed behind Jalen Lee. So it looks like Jalen Lee will be getting a start uh, right there at the nose tackle position. Other defensive end spot, Jervon Dexter, Tyreek Sapp, Chris McClellan. I expect almost every one of those names I listed right there. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Yeah. If I can count right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Nine players there between defensive end, nose tackle, Probably will be on the field Saturday versus Utah. We know their style of brand, their brand of football, their physicality. Florida's going to have to rotate some players in and out right there at defensive end. Nose tackle right there. I expect most, if not all, of those names are just listed for those positions to be on the field Saturday night. All right, let's go to Jack. Brenton Cox gets the start at the Jack position. Antoine Powell after him, Lloyd Summerall, David Reese. There's your four jacks in this defense. Linebacker Ventrell Miller, no surprise there. Listed behind him, though. And there are no oars listed right here at this linebacker position. Starts with Ventrell Miller. Then it goes Scooby Williams, Derek Wingo. Move to the other linebacker position. Amari Bernie listed as a starter. Then true freshman Shamar James, then the one black. So some of the younger players at the linebacker position getting slotted in behind the starters. Scooby Williams behind Ventro Miller, Shamar James behind Amari Bernie. I expect all those guys to play, all, all six of those guys there. Throw in Derek Wingo and one Black as well. But if look, we could be breaking this down way too much. We could be looking too far into this. 
But, you know, you put it out there, you're going to notice if there's a younger player listed above, especially going and looking at the names of Derek Wingo, who had some some experience. DeWan Black, who we had heard had a really good spring, was creating turnovers in the spring. Now, admittedly, and we have discussed this, we have not heard his name a whole lot this fall. We have heard Shamar James, the true freshman, come in and, hear, and, and his name being called all throughout fall camp. Maybe that's bleeding over into this depth chart a bit where he's listed behind Amari Bernie. Star, uh, as we've kind of been going through fall camp, we know we've been hitting at some of these positions. Expect Travez Johnson to get that start. That's exactly what happens here. Jadarius Perkins after him. Kamar Will Coxon goes to three deep there at the star position. Cornerback, Jason Marshall. Good to see him there, of course. Dylan with the hamstring injury. Most of fall camp. Come back last week. Gets the start at one of the cornerback spots. Devin Moore listed behind him, so that does mean... I'll go ahead and go to the other cornerback spot. With Devin Moore listed behind Jason Marshall, Avery Helm gets to start at the other cornerback spot. No surprise there. I don't, I, I don't think... Was hearing good things, about, good things about Helm throughout fall camp at the same time. Moore, you know, of course, turned some heads early on in fall camp. One of the very first practices was getting some starter reps there. I think the very next practice, it was Avery Helm getting the starting reps there. So given the experience, played a little bit better last year. Yeah, the competition eased up toward the end of the year. Avery Helm did start playing better toward the end of the year at the same time. He's bulked up, put on some weight. Gets that start at the other cornerback spot. So going back to cornerback one, Jason Marshall, Devin Moore, Jordan Young. Nice spring game. Ready to see him on the field a little bit more. Uh, but Avery Helm, Jalen Kimber, and Ethan Pouncey are the three deep for the other cornerback spot. All right, let's move to safety here. Rashad Torrance, Trey Dean are listed as the starters. Behind, behind Rashad Torrance are Kamari Wilson and Corey Collier. Behind Trey Dean, Donovan McMillan, and Miguel Mitchell. So there is your starting offense and your starting defense for the Gators. Let's move to special teams. <coughs> Excuse me there. Still dealing with a <clears throat> little bit of the sickness from earlier this week. Jeremy Crawshaw listed. There is your starter. I'm trying to blow this up a little bit. Can't, uh, there we go. Okay. So punter, Jeremy Crawshaw, there's your start and punter there. And man, this spot so small. Here we go. Adam, uh, well, wow. okay. New name there. Uh, Adam Mahalik, <laughs> place kicker, or Trey Smack. Uh, they're listed for uh, your Gators at kicker. And then let's go to specialist uh, kickoff returner. Jamarcus Weston's name is listed as kickoff returner along with Trevor Etienne or Naquan Wright, Xavier Henderson. Uh, so Trevor Etienne's name gets thrown in the mix there at kickoff returner. Uh, Jamarcus Weston, I know... Everybody goes back to the Alabama game last year uh, and dropping the ball at the one-yard line. It sets up the uh, memorable 99-yard drive for the Gators, uh, but uh, can't have those type of uh, you know brain lapses uh, in, in some ball games there. So, but Jamarcus Weston listed listed right there at kickoff return, and then as at punt returner Xavier Henderson still there, Jason Marshall or Trevor Etienne listed there as well. So. ETN listed on the running back depth chart and listed at kickoff return and punt return. So, true freshman coming in, making a name for himself. And we know all know Florida needs as much playmaking ability as they can get at special teams that has lacked under Dan Mullen, the previous staff. So, Weston, we've heard, you know, is a fast player. Haven't got to see a whole lot of it. Henderson, we, we, we know as fast, it just never looked like it on punt returns. Uh, but 
listed once again, second staff in a row, is putting Xavier Henderson right there at punt returner. So, yeah, overall surprises. No Lingard mentioned at all on the depth charts. Only goes three deep. Of course, he'd be the fourth. And then go to linebacker, Scooby Williams, listed behind Ventro Miller ahead of Derek Wingo, and Shamar James, listed above the one black behind Amari Bernie. So, there we go. No huge surprises, at least for your starters. Maybe some of the depth pieces. That's where you start looking at some of your surprises. And as I said, we will learn. This is the first depth chart we get from Billy Napier. We'll learn as the weeks go by (laughs) how much stock we can put in this. Uh, But, you know, go back to his press conference on Monday and... There seemed to be a thought process behind putting a depth chart out on Wednesday. Hey, we want to see practice on Monday. Team had, you know, I think the practice on Sunday, Monday. Team was off on Tuesday. So, you know, we'll watch our film. We'll have, well, Wednesday's practice probably, of course, doesn't play into it because they put this out as soon as practice was over and ahead of the press conference. So, you know, they wanted a couple more practices to set this depth chart. So, you know, we'll see. We'll we'll see what it all means. We'll see how much we can take away from it. I'm sure some gamesmanship's in here. Some guys are banged up. I mean, there there are four guys listed out, as I said. Let's go through those guys again. Arliss Boardingham, Jaden Hill, Jack Miller, David Connor. Miller, we already knew about. Jaden Hill, we already knew about. Boardingham, we, we heard about the injury, didn't necessarily know he would not play this game. So, four players are listed out, but we'll see if there's some gamesmanship in some of the other positions there. I know Kyle Whittingham, Utah's coach, in his press conference on Monday, he had said Ricky Pearsall was out. Now, I'm not sure if he's going by previous practice reports where he was out, and now we know he's back. Hopefully, he doesn't have any more information than we are getting. <laughs> Ricky Persaud missed this Saturday. But at the same time, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, once that came out Monday, I started asking around. And of course, you know, Florida wants to keep that under wraps as much as they possibly can, if that's the case. I haven't been able to confirm anything as far as Ricky Persaud not being available Saturday. So I expect him to be out there. Any more comes out. Uh, I'll, you know, I'm sure Florida doesn't want it out, but of course, we'll kind of keep beating around that bush to see if we can find out any more, but I expect him to be out there Saturday. But, no, there could be some gamesmanship. We'll have to see how Billy Napier plays this as far as injuries go and who he has on the depth chart if he's trying to, you know, throw the opponent off in any form or fashion. All right, guys, if you want to hop in here, come on. What you you thinking about this season? What you thinking about this depth chart? A lot of good stuff to get into with these Gators. I'm excited for Saturday. I know you guys are too. Hopefully many of you will be down there. All right, Daniel. It's like your mic is muted. There we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask about what you thought the rotation was going to be at nose tackle, if you had a thought on what the snap distribution would be, given what that depth chart was. Yeah, um, so Jalen Lee, um, well, there we go, tweet from Florida. Um Sold out versus LSU, so there we go. Uh, another sellout for the Gators there. Uh, but uh, Jalen Lee, Desmond Watson are the two names I expect to see there. I wouldn't be surprised even with this depth chart if Desmond Watson starts. Um, I do think he'll be limited snap count-wise. Uh, he was you know, still struggling throughout fall camp as far as that goes. But playing a team like Utah, I mean, you want him out there as much as he can possibly be out there. Uh, and playing as many snaps as he can, given his size 
And hopefully there's some ability to go along with that size. Hopefully Utah will have to double team him given that size. And it opens up Jervon Dexter and Brenton Cox and Prince Lee and Justice Boone, those guys that are around him. Uh, but I do think he'll be limited somewhat in a snap count. But can you can you be smart about it? Can you get him in early in the game when he, of course, is fresh? And then pick your places throughout the game. You know, short yardage situations. You know, Utah doesn't run a whole lot of hurry up. They're not going to run a whole lot of tempo. So there's probably going to be a lot of time where you have time to get him on the field and get him off the field. Now, Utah, you know, this is the first game of the season. They can work into their game plan. Hey, if, if 21's on the field, let's speed it up a little bit. Let's see if we can keep him out there. You know, if, if they know about it. If they know about his, you know, weight issue and the conditioning issue that goes along with that, if they see him out there on the field, do they identify that, keep him out there as much as they can? So, you know, that that is some part of that that makes me wonder how much Watson can be out there. Uh, but that's, that's not Utah's MO, and I can't see them really game planning around one player like that too much. Now, can they do it a little bit? Sure. Uh, but I don't. That's that's not their mo. I mean, they want to ground and pound and, and wear Florida's front out uh, in a traditional sense, not speed up and, and you know play play after play after play after play. So um, can you with that? Can you pick your places where you want to put Watson in? And hopefully, by the time the fourth quarter rolls around, that you, know, you started the game with him. Second and third quarter, you've put him in short yardage situations, running situations. And then in the fourth quarter, he's ready to go. And he's ready to be out there on the field. You know, if it's a close game and Utah still got their their, their game plan and they're still running the ball, of course you want Desmond Watson out there. So I expect a, I expect a healthy rotation uh, with, with Watson in there early in the game and in the fourth quarter. Uh, but, you know, good thing, you know, Jalen Lee, we haven't heard his name a whole lot. So hopefully he has earned that, you know, on this depth chart, you know, if we're, if we're, if we're going to really go into it, that he's earned his name being there at the top of the nose tackle depth chart. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, man. RB3, man, what's up? Hey, what's up, Dave? Can you hear me? Got you loud and clear. Hey, man, I feel like Weston back there only for his hands. That's why I'm like, why, why we ain't got no big-time playmaker back there on kickoff return? That's why I thought a guy like Finley Graham would have been able to benefit from being back that way. His speed, we need more speed at the uh, on special teams. And he's I mean, he's supposed to be one of the fastest players on the team, and but like I said, you know we have we've yet to really see it. Um, so yeah. you know I, I'm hoping that when these when these uh, speed charts come out and all these you know feedback we get from speed, Jamarcus, Jamarcus Weston's name's up there. I remember Dan Mullen saying it last year, and I believe somebody else said it. I don't, I don't remember. I can't put a name on it, but somebody else said it back in the spring, or one of the players said it on one of our Gator Collective uh, spaces or something that, you know, Weston is one of the fastest players on the team, but kind of like Xavier Henderson in a way, we we haven't seen that speed play out. <laughs> so um, yeah. uh, I'm uh, hoping – that this staff does see that. Uh, and uh, But, you know, I agree. Um, that's probably where I still expected to see Lingard's name, maybe someone. If he's, yeah. not, if he's not listed as one of your top three running backs, can he be a kick returner? Can he be a punt returner? Uh, and his name's not there either. So I don't – as far as I know, there's nothing going on uh, with Lorenzo Lingard. Uh, but uh, I was kind of surprised that we didn't see him at the running back spot and or uh, one of the, uh, you know, kick return, punt return. Good deal, man. Hey, one more thing. You think ETN gonna get a lot of carries this year? He could be out between the tackles uh back this year? Um Montrell's gonna be your main between the tackles. Um I mean, but shoot. I mean he's <laughs> Mar Johnson's listed at two eighteen, ETN's two seventeen. And he he's so he's not small. Uh so yeah, I oh, mean wow. yeah, if he can be he he can be your other guy. You know, you, you need more than one that can take it between the tackles. Uh oh, yeah. right being your you know, all purpose and maybe Lingard the same fashion, more of an all purpose and using his speed if he gets <laughs> to the outside. Uh so yeah, maybe you're looking at Wright and Lingard being your more outside the tackle guys. And Johnson, ETN, being your inside. There you go. All right, man. I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks, man. Yep. All right. Here we go. Trying 
tr- having trouble breaking this name down on Twitter, but uh, the late Adam Lloyd. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Dave. How's it going? Good. How about you, man? Good, good. I'm only bringing this up because it's the first game of the season. Sometimes you, you hear about these things or you see this, but um, you haven't heard about any discipline issues where guys might be out for a half or a game, or could that potentially explain some of the curiosities on the depth chart? Uh, I have not heard. I've actually heard um, right now that there are none. <laughs> so, you know, now if it, it may be being kept quiet, but as of now, uh, even before this depth chart, was hearing that there are no issues there. Uh, so, should be good to go. And because, like as I said, that's kind of one reason I brought up the Lingard thing and saying I haven't heard anything, even as far as that goes, of you know any player being in trouble or no, not not taking care of whatever it is uh, and not being able to play on Saturday. But, um, yeah, as far as I know, it does look like a pretty clean, disciplined team as well heading into Saturday. Awesome. I hope that's the case. Go Gators. Go Gators. All right, Gator Josh. What's up, Josh? Hey, Dave. Uh I think this Gators team is very – there's just a lot of mystery around it and then what makes Saturday really interesting. When you look at the Utah side, although they had a great season last year, they are losing a lot of their productive players on offense and defense. They got new players, and their stats all really on defense weren't spectacular if you break uh, break it down on some of the stats that you and others have uh, talked about the last week or so. And then with Florida, there's so much unknown because of uh, the way the staff last year and Dan Mullen really went to – you know, only playing seniority, there's, I just think there's so much untapped potential and talent on this team and that we're really not going to know who this team is, who's actually really good and who could, you know, who's going to uh, show up every week. Um, and really until this game and then into Kentucky, you know, I just, it's just crazy how this season is and so much mystery and unknown going into Saturday. But uh, my first Twitter save, I appreciate all your work and uh, appreciate it. And uh, go Gators and let's get a win on Saturday. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is one thing is, if here of, you know, looking at and, and just kind of past the players, it is still the, the, the known versus the unknown in Utah. They, they know it, it is a culture. They know their culture. They know their philosophy. They know their scheme. They know the expectations. All that is new at Florida. And now we, now we know some of the players and of course, and there's some experience to go along with that, but looking past the players, that is where the known versus the unknown comes in. Uh, and still, you know, for and, and I thought I'll throw this nugget out. This episode's going on right now on YouTube, so I'm in two places at one time with the the magic of the internet right now. But uh, of the 115 players that participated in fall camp for Utah, 86 were underclassmen, freshmen, redshirt freshmen, and sophomores. So there's some unknown there too, as you, as you were saying, Josh. As far as their roster goes, now they are experienced at quarterback, they're experienced at tight end, they're experienced in some of the important places for their style of play. But overall, they're a pretty inexperienced team as well, and a lot of those guys are making their first appearance in an atmosphere like this for the first time Saturday night. That's seventy four percent of their roster. That are underclassmen. Of the 86, 54 freshmen, true or redshirt, 32 are sophomores. That's the sixth youngest roster among Power 5 teams. So there is a lot of known for Utah because of who they bring back in, in, in certain places, but overall, they're a pretty inexperienced team. So if they have to go down the depth chart, they're relying on some young guys. No, Dave, uh, I don't know if I can jump back here, but I 1,000% agree. Plus, we talk about the weather. I know a lot of folks uh, from Utah don't think it's a big deal. You know, I've lived in Colorado. I've been in Utah before. It's different down here. You you, you, you taste the heat down here. You taste the air outside. <laughs> um, but, I mean, plus there's about a 40,000 fan difference from where they play at 50, 51,000 fans in Utah versus they're in the swamp plus on top of you. They play on that natural turf. We play on real grass. The ball bounce is a little different. So I, I, I really do think uh, Utah is, you know, 
is really in for it on Monday or on uh, Saturday. Um, even if Florida starts off a little slow, I just still think that uh, we end up getting the upper hand and pulling that out. Sounds good. Thank you, Josh. Bring in a Roscoe's been waiting. Let's see. What's up, Roscoe? You still there, man? Yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you loud and clear. Yeah, I got you loud and clear. Yeah, man. I just want to. Uh, Couple questions. Um, what do you think about the um, looking at the depth chart, and what do you think about? I know we've moved into the uh, more spread offenses and everything now, and I see we run the three three five. What do you feel? How do you feel about that three three five when we dealing with a team that want to run directly at us? Is um our DC is his um defense multiple where it can go down to four down linemen or whatever? Uh, that was my first question, and my second question is. Um, what do you think it's going to take for Burt to get his maximum potential? Because I feel like he may be the best receiver on the team, but he just hasn't put it all there in his head yet. And go Gators, man. Yeah, Burt, a young guy, you know, could possibly be that you know, downfield threat. Uh, we saw Flash, uh, what, last year versus South Carolina. Uh, so, you know, and the guy I've always you know, tried to keep a close eye on because he's from here in Jacksonville at Trinity Christian. Uh, so, you know, he's always been on my radar. Uh, there, so right. you know, try to try and keep up with him a bit. So yeah, I mean, he can. I think we still need uh, to see Florida come up with a receiver that can consistently take the top off of the defense. And I think Burke is probably one of the few that can do that. It's very similar. It's not surprising that he's in that wide receiver grouping with Xavier Henderson, uh, and, and you know, playing that same slot at the wide receiver, not in, in the slot, but you know the same position at wide receiver there on the outside uh, for, for for Henderson and Burke. So I think they're going to be asked to do a lot of the same things there. You know, take your top off the uh, defense. Not your quick slasher type of receivers, of course, but guys that can get down the field. Hopefully use that speed to take the, take the top off the defense here. So, uh, yeah, and, and going to the defense, uh, as you said, you know, you got your defensive end, nose tackle, defensive end. Uh, Jack, linebacker, linebacker. And Jack is that outside linebacker slash rush uh, there. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, some points Florida go four down. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I have to go back and look at some more Tony. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think if you, you know, if, if it proves you have to, then, I mean, Utah will come out with two tight end, three tight end sets. And, <laughs> you know, that, that, that might force your hand a bit. Uh, so uh, I think – a course of <laughs> right. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, Utah and, and what they come out with uh, that could force your hand to where to where you're bringing a, another defensive lineman in uh, at the same time. I, 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 I'm interested too in seeing if we see a combination of you know three of the more true linebackers. Do we see uh, Miller, Bernie, and you know, Shamar out there at the same time? Uh, you know, can, can you go you know, three true linebackers uh, at, at, at points? So, you know, I think they're – Florida's linebackers have a lot of responsibility in this game, uh, whether it be Cam Rising running Cam Ri- and, and having to contain him and spy him at times maybe. Also, their tight ends are, getting, are going to be involved in a passing game as well. So your linebackers are going to have to be matched up on those guys at, at points in the game. Of course, you got to worry about the Utah run game with just the, the, the traditional running backs. So – Florida's linebackers have a lot of responsibility in this game, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see how Patrick Tony has to either help them out sometimes, uh, whether that be bring another, you know, bring bring a safety in the box uh, as your quote unquote third linebacker, or just bring a third linebacker in altogether uh, and, and help. So um, I think there's going to be a little filling out process uh, and how much early success Utah has before we kind of maybe really get a feel of, you know, how Patrick Tony is going to respond there. I appreciate that. Yeah. I feel like it's going to be like a little chess match with their offense and our defense trying to see who can kind of take control of, I'm going to dictate of how we're going to play this game versus the other. I mean, hopefully it just starts up front, you know, and and, and Prince Lee and, and Lee and Watson and, and, and Dexter are just completely dominating. And it just makes, Dominate, a little, right. it, exactly. makes it just a little bit easier <laughs> on those linebackers. Oh, yeah. No problem. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. Mm-hmm. 
Stink, man, you in here? Yo. What's up, man? DW, what's going on, my guy? Not much, not much. Been a while. Hey, can you? I know it, right? I know it. Hey, I got a question for you. Well, I know you, you know, you're more plugged in than we are with the, uh, what's going on in practice. So I need you to do a little convincing of why zero started, man. I just need to know. Just help me out with that. Besides uh, him being a senior. Yeah, I know. I know, I, I know Tony likes him. Um, likes his versatility there. Um, I mean, we, dude, it was 10, 15 minutes of open practice. It's hard, ain't it? I know it it's is. Hard. Yeah, 10, 15 minutes of open <laughs> practice. Um, it's... Now, he had a really, really good spring. I, w- I will say that. The spring was really good. I haven't heard a whole lot of trading in the fall. Um, and Donovan McMillan's a player I, I'm I'm kind of excited to see. Uh, but you know, That's who I want. That's who I want back there. Yeah. That's uh, just me, though. I'm not a coach. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not either. And not hearing a whole lot of trading in, in the last few weeks. Um, I won't say that worries me in, in any any sense of the, of the word. Uh, but uh, I do know dating back to the spring that they, they thought really highly of, uh, of trading. So, you know, I, I've said it plenty of times on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm probably even said it on, on Twitter too. Um, I, I'm willing to give a blank slate to a lot of these players, whether that be Brenton Cox or that be Amari Bernie and trading uh, just with this new staff. But I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping this is a good sign first and foremost. But if it's not, you know, if trading goes, I want this. Is- I wanted to succeed now, but right. if you go out there, man, that first play or two, if he mess up, bro, I hope they pull him. If they don't pull him, then, you know, yeah. I got a question. Right, yeah, if we see those terrible ankles, <laughs> angles still be taken and, you know, just taking yourself out of position to even to try and go make a tackle, you know, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay, go, 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 go get me somebody else to put in there. Um, I don't think this is a seniority thing. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people didn't want Amari Bernie out there at linebacker either, but we do see Shamar James right behind him and not DeWan Black. And at the other linebacker position, we see Scooby Williams behind Ventro Miller and not Derek Wingo. So I don't think it's an experienced seniority thing uh, when you start looking at it. Uh, but I'll say, you know, I'll probably lean on just all the good I heard going back to spring probably leans or lends itself to why I think trading's the starter at safety. All right, before I go, man, go camp. Just want to say what's up to you, my guy. Thanks, Dink. What's up, Trey? What's up, Dave? You doing all right, man? I'm good. You uh, you driving from Louisiana yet, or flying from Louisiana? Uh, no, <laughs> no, we're leaving tomorrow morning at nine. Man. There we go. Tomorrow morning at making that nine hour drive. There we go. No, man, I wanted to uh, go back to that running back situation. So with Lingard, you know, not being anywhere present on that depth chart, it just leads me to believe that there's something going on. Um, And no speculation, no nothing. I mean, you know as well as me, I have no connections in this. But to completely be off of it in the kick return, punt return, any aspect where he can help the team, when he seemed to be such a vital part of the offense and just the team in itself in spring, and then just to be gone – I know some we talked about in the Discord where it's just like he disappeared. But uh, just talking about ETN and Montreal being from South Louisiana, I mean, ETN played 30 minutes for my high school where I played, and Montreal played in Lafayette where I live now. And one thing for sure, if we see ETN on the field this year making plays, that is a huge, huge um, pat on the back that needs to be given to Jaluk and to Billy Napier because – as far as his name, highly regarded, but as far as pressure in the recruiting aspect, he was a four star, <clears throat> excuse me, but was not nowhere nearly highly as regarded as brother. And if you to ask many, many of the guys that cover recruiting here in the state of Louisiana, if he would have got significant reps as a true freshman at any SEC or big major college, they'd have probably told you no way. I, I know a couple guys that write for some local um websites local magazines and he just wasn't regarded as a highly ready to run you know out the gate freshman so if he does get significant play time and and productive i think that is a huge huge uh they deserve a huge um, pat on the back for just being able to see that recruit him real hard when other schools from louisiana and this area weren't 
And um, I think that'd be great for that young kid because as a freshman to be able to do that would be great. And then on Montreal, I mean, he was great at UL. I've watched him play six games in person. He was great. He's not going to be the fastest guy on the team. But I don't think we really need that when we have somebody like Wright. Um, it would have been nice to have a Lingard there for just pure speed, straight line out that backfield. But I, I'm really excited about the running back room and seeing all this stuff about ETN, man. It, it, it just gets me going, like I said, 30 minutes from the house. And to be kind of under-recruited and, and to be getting all this love so far, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, what, what I hope this means is, you know, I, I'm hoping, you know, I had Lorenzo Lingard on, on Gators Breakdown. Uh, I mean, one of the you know, nicest – most well-respected players, you know, I, I hope this means that he still is involved a whole lot. He's just not listed. And as I said, if you look at the, yep. if you look at the depth chart here on the offensive side, it doesn't go past three names. Hopefully for whatever reason that plays into it somewhat, yes. I still expect him to get some carry Saturday night. So I guess let me, let me start there, but it probably is a good sign. You know, if Lorenzo Lingard did have that good spring and he did have a somewhat good fall camp, Maybe Trevor Etienne just had a better fall camp. Maybe he's just yep. come out and, and proven to be a better player throughout these last four weeks. And that's a good sign for Florida. And look, honestly, it's a good sign in a way. And, and I don't want to go recruiting too much, but all right, this might turn some heads for some recruits out there. Hey, this freshman's getting talked about. Devin Moore, Definitely. Shamar James. Definitely. You know, so I mean, you know, you hope yep. you hope some you hope some recruits out there take notice as well. And, and and once you start recruiting at this higher level, and like yep. you said, don't want to go into recruiting. This is game time. This is we're done with that for now. It's not recruiting season. I, <laughs> but as we go into that, that it does show that it is a new regime, and that the seniority isn't everything, and that these new kids, if you put it on the field and in practice, you're gonna get some play. You're gonna get recognized on a depth chart. You're gonna get recognized this Saturday in the swamp in front of ninety three thousand as a freshman, as long as you work. And I'm with you. Everything I've ever heard from Lingard, everything I've ever read about him, he is a stand-up guy. And so that's why I guess a lot of people's heads really turned is because he does seem like such a good kid, and I want nothing but the best for him. So, But uh, but thanks for taking me, man, and I'll uh, I'll hit you guys up Saturday morning and go Gators. All right, man. We'll see you Saturday. Uh, yeah, and, and here's the thing, you know, and, 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 and Stink asked about it earlier too with Trey Dean and stuff. You know, maybe – him and Donovan McMillan are just so close on the depth chart. Okay, and then you go with the senior. You know, if there's not a lot of separation, if there's not a lot of separation from Amari Bernie and Shamar James right now. Okay, then you, then you go senior. Now, if it's game two and it's game three, and I think we all see where maybe Donovan McMillan is making some plays and maybe Shamar James is out there making some plays. All right, well, then maybe it doesn't take till – game eight or nine before we see those guys on a more consistent basis. Maybe the, the change is made when it needs to be, but maybe to start this season and the, 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 the margin is razor thin between these guys. All right. Then you're going to roll with the experience. I have no issue with that. All right. A few of more of you in here. I'll be calling it in about 15 or so minutes. It'll give us about an hour here. Justin. Justin Wood, you good? Yeah, you might might be muted if you're ready to go. I know some of you've been waiting for a little bit. All right, we'll come back. All right. I'm ready. Oh, okay, there you go. Yep. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I had it muted, like you said. Yeah, all good. Um, anyways, uh, I, I know y'all, a lot of y'all has been talking about this, but, but I mean, I, I just want to piggyback what everybody off, what everybody else is saying about, you know, Dewan Black and Lingard, you know, it makes me wonder if, you know, I, I know they're both good kids, but it makes me wonder if they're in the doghouse or something, you know, but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it may just be what you say that, that, you know, that, that ETN and all, you know, and all the other guys have just been a lot better than them. Yeah, I mean, there, there there could be some small thing, you know. They're like, no, I, I, like I said, I've heard of no suspensions, but maybe there is some small thing, maybe late to one team meeting or something, you know, nothing major, nothing to hold them out for a game. But you know, maybe maybe that plays into it. Like I said, there there are things we can read too much into <laughs> with the depth chart. That might be one, that, and that might be one of them. But, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if we'll get any more clarification, and maybe some more will come out tonight since the depth chart's been released. Maybe some lips will start, 
you know, talking a little bit. But as far as I know, I, I, you know, I'm, we had heard Trevor Etienne making moves this fall camp, and maybe this was, you know, just a sign that that all 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 of what we were hearing through fall camp was pretty pretty true about Trevor Etienne. And also an interesting thing I saw when I was looking at the depth chart, maybe I looked at it wrong, but it said uh, it said that Cam Waits was was backing up uh, Garage. I was yep. I was puzzled with that because I thought I thought Barber was back was going to be the guy that's backing up Garage. Well, they have Barber at right tackle back, backing up Tarquin. So and that makes sense only because Tarquin slid, slid over to left tackle when Garage was out, so Barber was playing right tackle. So he got the I got you. he got the experience at right tackle, and now he's going to back up Tarquin since Tarquin, of course, will slide back to right since Garage is back in the starting lineup. Have y'all have y'all heard anything about the Ty Bowman kid anymore? Because I thought I thought I was hearing hearing that they were trying him out at uh you know kick returner, and you know that he was he was having a good camp. Yeah, I did hear that too about the uh, return specialist for him, but yeah, no, uh, he's not listed on the depth chart at all. And like I said, I, I think there's a good possibility if Florida goes deeper, especially on the offensive side uh, there. But as I said, it only goes three deep in some of the positions here. Uh, so I think there's a good chance there's going to be some guys, of course. I, I, like I said, I, I expect Lingard to get some carries. Uh, and, I, and you said, you know, Ty Bowman there. Um, you know, we saw some highlights uh, right there. But I think the guys, mostly at receiver, the names that are listed on the depth chart, those, those are going to be your guys there. And and also to piggyback a couple, a couple of things, you know, the other guys are talking about with like the, the heat and everything is – the thing with Florida is it's like you, you can't breathe because the air's so heavy and it's like it doesn't matter how how hot they get it over in Utah, you know, turn up the heat and everything. It's like it's the fact that the you know, the air's really heavy. That's that's what makes it hard to play in the swamp, you know, and that's the you know, I think if we were playing in a neutral side, I would you know, I wouldn't feel as good about this game, but you know, I feel pretty good about it since, you know, we're playing in the swamp. Yeah, we know. Well, I, I think there's there, there's something about that. You know, I'll, I say more about that on my Utah preview episode. So I don't want to I don't want to give that away a little, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, All right, but uh, yeah, it does. I, I do speak a little bit on that. But like I said, that that, that episode uh, should be ending right now on YouTube. But uh, it should be out there on the podcast platforms and YouTube as well. Uh, but yeah, I go definitely more into the game, uh, big time preview there. It was a really good preview. Uh, I, I brought on. Uh, Porter Larson, he hosts a pregame show for the Utah flagship station there, uh, ESPN 700 from Salt Lake City. So really good preview uh, from the Utah side of things as well. So, All right. Well, looking forward to listening to it. I appreciate you getting me on, Dave. Thanks, man. Okay, let me see. I don't know what order everybody joined in, so I'm hopefully I'm not making people wait too long. Keith Wynn. Keith, you in here? Okay, maybe not. See nobody, 444. All right. Nobody? Nobody? 444? Man, y'all don't want to talk? No, I'm, 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 I'm in here. Now. <laughs> I'm in here. There we go. What's I got on, you. Man? Thank, yeah, thank you for letting me in. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, honestly, a lot of my questions already got answered. Uh, okay. Everybody, a lot of people asked a lot of the same questions. Just the thing with uh, – I know he just did it with Daiwan, though, so you, so you, you don't think it's uh, – because I, I think I've seen somebody said something about handling responsibilities. I think I've seen a tweet – about him, somebody saying that is it just like off the field, or is it is he just getting outplayed? I, I mean, like, I'm, what's going on there? Because it's pretty late in his career at this point here. We, you know, we're trying to, you know, he's a he's a popular guy. You know, um, yep. I've been voting uh, rooting for him for a minute. And it's like, you know, that that one kind of hurts, man. Seeing that, and then Lingard too. But for sure, Darwin. I mean, I you know support my guy, and it's like, dang, man, and just. Yeah, that was that was on. that was that was me that tweeted it about the handling your responsibility there. Um, like I said, I don't think okay, it's yeah. I, yeah, I don't think it's anything major, um, but uh, some I, I'll just say some minor stuff. I'm I'm not throwing laundry out there. That's not my not my game. 
Um, you know, I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not throwing players under the bus here, but uh, and, and I will say it is something, but probably very, you know very minor from everything I know. So, and, and, that, and that might be you. contributing to part of that. I got you. Hey, just DM me, um, DW. I put it out. <laughs> Yeah, let 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 me know whenever you figure out. <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing bad, guys. I, I'll I'll say that. It's just you know, you, 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 you know how college kids are. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I I, I hear you. I hear you. All right, where is that crazy noise coming from? Hey, King, can you mute, mute your mic? Are you pretty tall? Damn, I just I just. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that was some... <laughs> you pushed them down, did oh. There we go. Okay, there we go. So, there was some crazy noise going on there. Hey. Yeah, if so I think Keith will get ready to talk. Do you, you throw him out the chat? You, you got rid of him. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I think that's where the crazy noise was coming from, so. Yeah, well. Hey, of course. So, um, you have somebody else coming up? If not, I'll put that as a question. Uh, I got six more that I'll try and get to before I go. But go ahead, go ahead while you're in here. I about to say they they are not important. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Forrest, I'm just playing with y'all. Hey, Forrest, the kick and punt return. Do we we don't have anybody with no speed? Any kind of shift in this? I mean, nobody that, that's maybe everybody we got. They just run straight. We need someone who can, you know, um, for the long run, so, you got to have someone that can get away from a tackle or something. Yeah, Mar- Marshall is listed as the second punt returner. Special team been down too long. Yeah, Marshall is listed as the second punt returner, and Naquan is listed on kickoff, but not starter. So, I mean, going to your point, starting, no, you're right. It's more of your straight line of, you know, Weston, Henderson. Um, but there is right ETN and Marshall listed in that kickoff punt return group <clears throat> as well. So there's maybe more of your shifting that's coming from that group. Uh, but, yeah, if, if it is Weston mostly and Henderson mostly, you're right. It's just... You know, maybe maybe that's their style too. Uh, more of all right. The, our, our blocking scheme is you know you you know you, we're not asking you to, to to make people miss. You know, punt return that that's more what that is anyway. Of course, kickoff return. You know, I don't get too up in arms about kickoff return unless you don't do something stupid because you're not returning many of them anyway in in today's football. But punt return, I'd love to have some more playmaking ability there. Okay, Carl, that's a question for you. When the last time we ran a kickoff back? Kickoff back. back. Ooh, punt back was what? Freddie Swain, Colorado State? Okay, yeah, Freddie Swain. I think, but, yeah. man, kickoff return. I I think I knew that, but it's not on the top of my head right now, so I'm sure somebody will <laughs> come in here and remind me who it was. <laughs> Probably Andre DeBoe. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> he might be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm mute. All right, man. Well, we're going to Duval. Duval, you in here, man? Yeah, I'm here. There we go. Okay. Um, I was wondering how many wins do you think they'll get this season, and what's your uh, prediction of the uh, final score? Uh, go have to listen to my Utah preview for my score. I don't. I, I like. I, I don't want to. I don't want to throw away that uh, right now. So listen for that. Um, I did mean to put this in in there. Um, I, I believe I've said it earlier uh, when SEC Media Days came out, but more of how I see far, Florida finishing. Uh, I got the Gators going 9-3. and three. So uh, that can go either way, of course. And if I go either way, the bad part of that, I would lean closer to – eight and four than I would 10 and two, you know, if nine and three is where I see it, you know, if one game difference either way, I think eight and four is more likely than 10 and two with this schedule, who Florida plays all the newness there. Uh, but in the end, maybe some orange and blue glasses. I probably- yeah. I got about nine and three, eight and four. That sounds about good. I love your uh, podcast. I love your work, man. Go Gators. Thanks, man. All right, couple, hey, that's with a healthy AR, right? Oh yes, it's, yeah, oh yeah. If AR goes down, then I don't, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, that's uh, that, that's a scary proposition. 
All right, a couple more here. So hopefully nobody hops in. I don't want to have to cut you off here, but John and Burner Bob. Let me get John here first. What's up, John? Hey, how you doing, Dave? I'm good, man. How about you? Pretty good. My question is, um, so most places have the Gators as the underdog for this matchup. Mm -hmm. What what kind of um, response do you think would happen from, you know, like college football as a whole if the Gators come in and blow out Utah just like completely? Good question, man, because this Utah team is getting a lot of love. Uh, you see, you are seeing them picked in the top 10, of course, in every major poll, every, every preseason magazine. You're seeing them picked by major publications to go make the college football playoff. So I hope Florida gets the credit they would deserve by beating this team. And I hope the narrative after that is, oh, Utah was overrated. Well, maybe Florida was underrated. I mean, that, that, that's possible at the same time. Now, of course, we'll have, to, we'll have to play a season out before we can ultimately say those things. Uh, but I hope right off the heels of that, that the narrative is not Utah was overrated. I mean, you know, the season will have to play out, and maybe that is the case. But I hope on the heels of the game that that is not the narrative. Yes, sir, because if we beat Utah by like 20 points or 24 points, and then they run the table, okay. Yeah, you know, you can take away too much from one game, you know, positively or negatively. <laughs> so the, the the season playing out is is very important uh, for, for uh, the right narrative. But I do, like I said, I just don't. There's going to always be overreaction, and we will hear if that is the case. If Florida wins by one point over Utah, that Utah was overrated. Uh, but you know, it's uh, that's just uh, that's part of being uh, you know highly ranked and losing. Yeah, that you get that overrated label. Pretty quickly. Yes, sir. Thanks, Thanks John. The, the, narr- the narrative will be lose lose for Florida. Yeah, I could I could see that too. Um, yeah. If Florida wins, oh, it's a home game. You know, you we somebody uh, there, there'll be some revisionist history too. Oh, we probably should have saw this coming. <laughs> exactly. If they lose, they're gonna be. Uh-huh. Uh, I told you, great Gators ain't like that. If Florida win, they're gonna be. They supposed to win, and it's not. there could be some love for Florida. You know, like the Alabama game last year, where you get some kind of close loss. You know, and of course the season was still have to play out. Florida was still have to keep winning. Utah was still have to keep winning. But even on the heels of that, if it's if it plays out similarly to the Alabama game last year, now I'm not calling you Alabama Utah or you got Alabama by any means. I'm just saying that if it's a similar style game, the way it plays out and Florida loses by a field goal or, you know, it's this close hard fought game, there might be some respect for Florida. And then say Florida goes on to beat Kentucky the next week. Then I think a close loss to Utah will feel a little better in some of the voters eyes and the national narrative eyes. And yeah, I think um, it could, it could play out a bit like that. All right. Can I- can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. That? Yep. Yeah. So you don't think uh, as far as like talent wise, because I, I've seen another thing as far as like the four stars, that how many they had, how mm-hmm. many we had, how many five stars we had. Because that's always a conversation that we've been having in the past couple of years with Dan Mullen going against teams like Georgia, Alabama, those teams, Clemson, those guys that get the big guys that we didn't have the talent to match up with them. You don't think that and I'm asking? I don't. I don't know why this hasn't been taken into account. Like they are scheming. You know, they have a good scheme and they're a good coach team. But talent wise, sometimes talent can over overcome that because I mean, scheme can only get you so far. You know, uh, so is that not taken into account at all here? Or oh yeah, I think it should. And, that, and that's you know. Not to kind of ruin my Utah preview, but I did go that way a little bit. You know, Utah in a lot of ways, should win this game. But to close the gap, I think Florida's, Florida ta- Florida's talent does that. I think Anthony Richardson, living up to his potential, can do that. And then to maybe break the quote-unquote tie, Florida has some home field advantage, 
maybe weather plays more of a uh, a part than than Utah think it will. I think there's some there, there there are ways to look at it, but as far as the talent part goes, you know that can be erased a little bit by the as I said the known for Utah the the expectations the the scheme the philosophy they they know what to expect they know what to do with inside the program. You know Florida's still figuring that out. Billy Napier's still figuring this roster out. You know I know it's game one and. You, you 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 hope you're past a lot of that, but he's not going to be right now. I don't expect him to be. You know, he's still learning about this team, and especially without playing a game yet. You know, he's going to learn so much Saturday night, and these players are going to learn so much about expectations from the coaching staff, and you know what, um, how, how, you know, just the atmosphere of a game going both ways. So you know, that negates a little bit of the talent advantage, but you know, d- d- definitely uh, everybody knows I'm, I'm a stars matter guy. Uh, and that really means a lot at the top of college football. It means more there. And I think that's why we see in college football right now, there is a clear, especially for this year. And it may not, it may not turn out this way, but going into this season, there is a clear tier of teams of Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State, maybe throw Clemson in there, and then everybody else. You know, starting at number five with Notre Dame, which it's kind of crazy that they're that high with the first year head coach and Marcus Freeman. And I, I you know, I, I don't necessarily see it, but at the same time, I don't know who else I'm putting fifth. And that kind of goes to how we're seeing college football right now. You start at five and go through teams 30, 35, there's not a lot of separation. And we're seeing that in the Swamp Saturday night. I mean, you look at the the, the point spread between Utah and Florida, it's very small. And Utah's a seventh-ranked team and Florida's unranked. You know, I think if you count the votes up or whatever, Florida would be like 32nd or 33rd or something like that. There's not a lot of separation. There, there's, there's clear separation from the top three, four teams, but behind that, I mean, it's a it's a crapshoot. Not for long, maybe you recruit. There guy. we go. All right. Let's see. Wait, Thomas. Thomas Darty. My brother pointed that out. Look at the size difference between our line. I think we average like 50 pounds <laughs> on each of the defensive linemen. Yeah, you got that advantage. Um, they are, you know, Utah's replacing some defensive linemen and, and some linebackers, of course, too, at the same time. So, you know, I, you know, not only just talent advantage, but where Florida has it and that experience at the same time up front. You mentioned size and you know, there's size and experience up there for Florida up front. So, I mean, I do think, I mean, both <laughs> both teams are going to want to impose their will up front. I know both teams want to, want to be able to do that Saturday night, and I see a path for Florida being able to do that. Now, does that mean Florida wins the game? I don't know, but you know, I got some really good stats in the podcast about Utah and their run defense and. You know where they can struggle in a in a certain stat threshold that Florida needs to hit in the run game, and it probably lends itself to a pretty good chance of a, at a victory for the Gators. Uh, and it starts up front; it, it, it really does. Hey, DW, Will Mine had some interesting takes on that last part. Oh yeah, with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the players he chose for. Oh <laughs> I yeah, not, <laughs> but some of the players he chose to. <laughs> The break out of so I forgot what point it was, but I was like, "What?" Bro? It was the was really? it was the tandem <laughs> of uh, oh, who was it? He chose the uh, yeah yeah. Tra- I think Travis and you know, that yeah. was one of them. Yeah, I mean, it could happen, but I was like, what? <laughs> I'll know? give you some credit. I hope I hope it does. Yeah, I don't want to tell it. I want people to go listen to your pod. <laughs> All right, one more. Uh, it was like Marcus here, and that'd be it. Yeah, I think it's like it's crazy how I'm hearing a lot of you know stuff saying that okay, you know, 
we don't have as much talent as we should. But to be honest, you go back and look at last season, man, like a lot of one score games that we lost. And it's with a head coach that had a foot out the door. And I'm just like, I, I, I feel like this season, you know, nine and three, ten and two type stuff, like it's it's way more doable than people are giving us credit for. I think even, you know, with a new head coach, with, you know, not the biggest recruiting class last year, I think the talent wise is there. And with a coach that, you know, wants to do good and wants us to be successful, like I don't see why nine and three, ten and two isn't more expectation. Yeah, I def- definitely expect improvement because of that. And, and look, probably if you want to go back to last year, probably somewhere in the middle. I, do I think Florida probably played over their heads a bit versus Alabama and had that home crowd? Probably. I, I don't think Florida was that good, but they played that good that day. Um, and then look, and they played very good. No, no, okay, I won't necessarily say very good, but they played pretty good the very next week versus Tennessee at home. And then the wheels fell off. Uh, you know, whatever happened between Tennessee and the Kentucky game, <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't really know. Can't can't pinpoint that. Uh, and I'm not necessarily sure. Many people can either. And I, I think once whatever happened in Lexington that night, you know, it was definitely lack of preparation. I mean, we saw that going into that team uh, last year, going into that game, and, and the way that team just fell apart in every facet of uh, of the game last year. Well, I mean, maybe except for defense, but. Uh, yeah, you know, all the false starts and uh, some of the play calling there at the end of the first half of that game and stuff. You know, I'll say taking all that into account at the beginning of the season and then seeing just the wheels fall off, you still had some one-score games there. You know, probably somewhere in the middle. It's, the, it's not as good as it seemed maybe versus Alabama, but definitely nowhere as, as bad as it seemed versus South Carolina and, and, and Samford, uh, you know, those two games. So, you know, uh, the – I, I do look at it as saying I, I, Florida definitely wasn't as bad as it showed last year, uh, and I do take that into account a bit. And you, and you bring up having a staff there now that definitely cares. They're trying to instill that into the players as well as caring for the guy on your left, caring for the guy on your right, caring for the, guy, the people that are on the sideline that are in the building. That makes you want to go out there and, and not disappoint uh, people that really count on you, and, and how far does that go? I mean, you know, there, there's still a lot of newness. You know, the coaching transitions are not always easy. Um, the two best in the SEC right now, Nick Saban, struggled in year one at Alabama. Kirby Smart at Georgia, you know, they, they had more talent there than their record indicated. You know, they lost to Vanderbilt. They struggled versus Nichols. Uh, I think I think it was that year one with, with Kirby Smart. That's the two best coaches in the league right now. Two of the best coaches in the country, and you know, had some bad. For Nick Saban at Bama in a very average year for for Kirby Smart at Georgia, and that was his first job. This isn't this isn't Billy Napier's first job. Billy Napier knows what to expect as a head coach, but transition is not always easy. You know, it doesn't mean instant success just because uh, you make a coaching change. But I hope you know those small things that can be fixed that needed to be fixed go a long way, uh, and, and I think they can. Um, and you know, I, I I expect, as I said, I, I I expect nine and three. As you know, my I'm predicting nine and three. I wouldn't be surprised with a, with an eight and four season. You know, could it go worse than that? Absolutely. I wouldn't be floored if Florida wins seven games. Like I said, transitions are not always easy. I don't expect it. I wouldn't be completely shocked. Now, if AR's completely healthy and Florida still somehow goes six and six and Maybe even seven and five there with a completely healthy AR. I'd probably be a little surprised, but I always fall back. Sometimes you just never know with transitions. It's not easy. I mean, and especially with this schedule, this is a pretty tough schedule for Florida. You open up with two tough games. There's no easy sledding the first month of the season, really, with Tennessee. You know, three of the first four games are, are, are not easy. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no room for error in the first month of the season for the Gators. And you hopefully that doesn't, that doesn't snowball early on if, if Florida comes out on the wrong way of the, of the first month of the season. Went off on a little tangent there, huh? All right, that'll do it right here. Sorry for everybody uh, requesting to get in here. Uh, I was looking at about, about an hour, so definitely got to get going. 
plenty of content out there right now. A couple of episodes out there. Utah preview just went up. There'll be a Gators Breakdown Plus episode, Q&A style, probably tomorrow. So, lots of good stuff coming from the Gators Breakdown side of things ahead of this big game versus Utah, everybody. Thanks for hopping on this Twitter space. Uh, We'll do it again. We'll do one in the early week like we did last year, and we'll do one late in the week as well. Enjoy chatting it up with you when the Gators are on the field playing some football. So, all right, that'll do it for this Twitter Spaces, everybody. I'll catch you on the next one.